Did you know that there are only two active players in the NBA who were drafted in 2010? Well, here's the weird part. You go back to the 2009 NBA draft and there's still lots of people still in the league. So it got me thinking, what happened to everyone in 2010? From top pick John Wall to 30th pick Lazar Hayward, here's what actually happened to the 30 players in the 2010 draft. The Washington Wizards select John Wall from the University Back in 2010, John Wall was the NBA's next best thing. A high flyer with serious passing skills, and guess what? His shooting game wasn't as bad as people said. His accuracy from the field and beyond the arc was actually better than Iverson's. Now, sure, he hit a rough patch with a torn Achilles in 2019 that messed up his game for a bit, but that does not take away from his awesome career. The guy's been a five-time All-Star, even making it to the All-Defensive second team in the 2014-15 season and the All-NBA third team in the 2016-17 season. Now, don't get me wrong, he ain't perfect and his best years might be behind him, but he held it down for the Wizards. They made it to the playoffs four out of five times from the 2013-14 season to 2017-18 season, with Wall leading the pack. So what happened to him? Well, injuries did get the best of Wall. The missed playing time has not only hindered his skill development, but also hurt his chances at opportunities with other teams. Wall's multi-year contract extension with the Washington Wizards, which he signed prior to the injuries, has added financial complexities to his situation. Trade possibilities, once promising, have faded due to both his injury history and his contract size. Beyond the physical toll, the mental and emotional challenges of rehabbing injuries cannot be underestimated, as the frustration and uncertainty inevitably seeped into Wall's mind, along with the passing of his mother and grandmother. With all of this going on, this almost caused Wall to take his own life. But through therapy and working through his emotions, he was able to get through it. While Wall's resilience and determination are evident, it wasn't enough to keep him on the court. Houston was playing games with him, and when he got to the Clippers, he thought he finally found a home, but little did he know he would get traded right back to Houston, the place he just came from. And after that, they waived him. But on a much brighter note, John Wall's been doing some great things off the court. He's actively involved in philanthropy through the John Wall Family Foundation. The foundation's mission focuses on improving the quality of life for underserved families and children in the Washington DC metropolitan area and his hometown of Raleigh, North Carolina. The foundation has been involved in various initiatives, including back to school drives, holiday events, community outreach programs, and support for families in need. It has also organized basketball camps and mentoring programs for the youth. Appreciate you, John Wall. The Philadelphia 76ers select Evan Turner from NBA fans all over would agree that being the number two pick rarely leads to stardom. For real, in the last two decades, just five second overall picks made it to the all-star status, and even fewer became reliable starters. But pinpointing the average number two player, you'd land on Evan Turner, nabbed by the Sixers in the 2010 draft. The media was raving about his shot creation and versatility, despite concerns about his shooting and athleticism. His NBA debut was pretty much uh, underwhelming, making Philly regret passing on DeMarcus Cousins, Greg Monroe, and Paul George. Then came the 2013-14 season, and Turner turned the tide. Turner transformed into one of Philly's top offensive assets and proved he's no bench warmer. It didn't matter which team he played for. He was a standout and he shook off that draft bus label, averaging 19 points, 6.3 rebounds, and 3.9 assists per game. His point average was nearly six points higher than his previous best. In his first four seasons, he upped his points, steals, and minutes per game. After Philly, Turner had stints at the Pacers, Celtics, Trailblazers, and finally the Atlanta Hawks, where he finally called it quits on his NBA career in 2020. After his NBA days, Turner was an assistant coach with the Boston Celtics during the 2020-21 season. Nowadays, he's spending lots of time with his kids and is running the Point Forward podcast with Andre Iguodala. But he's kept his love for hoops afloat even after his NBA career. Turner's involvement in youth basketball camps has provided aspiring athletes with skill development opportunities and mentorship. He's done a ton of good work with athletes from his hometown on the come up. Real quick guys, I hope you're enjoying today's video because with the amount of time and money we're spending on these videos, it would not be possible without today's sponsor, Pristine Auctions. Now, now, hold up before you go pressing that skip button because pristine auctions can be the solution to a problem you face every year that you may have not thought about. I know, hear me out, hear me out. Now, if you don't know what Pristine Auctions is, it is a sports memorabilia and collectibles auction site where here at auctions start at just $1 and each day there's thousands of autographed items available to be bought. Now, I know I said in the beginning this would solve a problem and you're probably asking yourself, Kai, like what, what problem is this gonna fix? And the answer is gifts. Whether it's your parents, your friends, your colleagues at work, what better of a gift to give anyone than memorabilia? 
Don't know what to get your dad for his birthday? Get him a signed jersey of his favorite player. Don't know what to get your sister for her birthday? Get her signed memorabilia of one of her favorite artists. And what about Uncle Louie? There's probably something on the website for him as well. Pristine auctions have the perfect gift for every person in your life regardless of age. Guys, affordable deals are happening all the time at pristineauction.com and not only do you get the product but you get a certificate of authenticity from the industry's most reputable authenticators. That way you know what you're getting is legit. Go add another piece to your collection or bless someone else in your life and get $10 off your first auction one when you use my code LOCKDOWN, yes LOCKDOWN in all caps at pristineauction.com links are in the description go buy another piece for your collection today or for someone else and now back to the video the new jersey nets select derek favors of george to be a third pick in the nba draft you got to impress a team with talent personality or potential look this pick is usually a jackpot for derek favors who was picked third overall by the nets and man this dude runs like a deer and jumps like he's spring-loaded yeah yeah i know the cliches are lame but seriously it fits him like a glove He's got the whole package, size, muscle, skill, and mad athleticism, the stuff NBA players dream of. Remember, I said this about other ballers like John Wall. Well, Favors is cut from the same cloth of freakish athleticism, and he ain't just muscle and hops. After a season with the Nets, Favors moved to the Utah Jazz in 2011. He rocked the Jazz jersey for a cool eight seasons, then took a detour to the New Orleans Pelicans in 2019. But hey, he boomeranged back to the Jazz in the 2020-21 season after a year with the Pelicans. During the second Jazz round, he stamped his mark at the 10th top scorer in Jazz history. This dude put up 7,255 points, passing Memo O'Kerr. He moved to the Thunder in 2021 and was traded to the likes of the Rockets and Hawks, but with no real playing time. The Minnesota Timberwolves select Wesley Johnson of Syracuse. All right, so back in the 2010 NBA draft, the Minnesota Timberwolves got a tough call. They didn't win the lottery pick, which landed them the fourth pick overall. So no chances of grabbing John Wall, Evan Turner, or Derek Favors, the big names of the draft. The Wolves were stuck between choosing Wesley Johnson from Syracuse or DeMarcus Cousins from Kentucky. They worried about Cousins' anger issues, so they went for Johnson. But honestly, a lot of folks even thought it was a bad move, and it seems like they may have been onto something. Truth is, the Wolves should have seen the writing on the wall. Yeah, Johnson had a solid senior year at Syracuse, but his time at Iowa State was nothing to write home about. After Iowa, he jumped ship to Syracuse for his last college season and was doing pretty good thanks to the better team. And that got the Wolves excited and they fell for it and picked Johnson. The funny thing is he was more like a sheep than a wolf, pun intended. Watching him at the Wolves, you'd think he's still at Iowa State. Not that he's a bad dude, he's got character, but looking at his player efficiency rating, it was about 5 when most NBA players hit around 15. Then came the Los Angeles Clippers. Johnson initially signed a one-year deal and played the opener against the Kings. He got three points and one steal in a win, and he liked it enough to stay for another year. Next for him was the New Orleans Pelicans. He was traded for Alexia Jensa, gave them a rotation, and then went on to the Washington Wizards in 2019. He swapped for Markeith Morris in a 2023 pick, but he then got waived in April. Then he went off to Greece to play with Panathinaikos in 2019 and played in the Greek Basket League and the Euro League before calling it quits on his career in 2020. The Sacramento Kings select DeMarcus Cousins. DeMarcus Cousins had his fair share of ups and downs in the NBA. Standing at 6'11 and weighing 270 pounds, Cousins burst onto the scene with an impressive rookie season after being picked fifth in the first round draft by the Kings and averaging 14 points and over eight rebounds per game. But there was drama too. He got suspended for a game for an altercation with a teammate, Dante Green. Injuries would go on to shape Cousins' career, especially the Achilles tear in 2018. Before that, he was a force to be reckoned with, earning the nickname Boogie in college for his guard-like footwork. His pre-injury stats are eye-catching, 21.2 points, 8.1 rebounds, 3.2 assists, 1.4 steals, and 1.2 blocks per game over 9 seasons. He even achieved rare feats like recording 20 points, 20 rebounds, and 10 assists, along with 5 blocks in one game, and back-to-back 2020-10 stat lines. Cousins has banked a whopping $94 million over 12 NBA seasons with 7 different teams. He made his mark with the Kings, Pelicans, and Warriors, but now he's taken his game to the Guaynabo Mets in the BSN League in Puerto Rico, a year after his last NBA appearance. His international career shines too. Cousins snagged gold with Team USA in the 2014 FIBA Basketball World Cup and the 2016 Olympics in Rio de Janeiro. The Golden State Warriors select Epe Udo from... So, a few days after the Golden State Warriors drafted Epe Udo at number six overall, some fans and bloggers were pretty upset. 
People were worried that he'd be another draft day disappointment from the Warriors pick like Patrick O'Brien. Not quite as gloomy as that, but maybe in the same league as E.K. Diogu, perhaps more like a Tyrus Thomas. Anyways, folks thought Udo's skills match better with picks around 11th or 15th. Even some basketball experts said the Warriors should have traded down and maybe gotten rid of Andres Biedrin's contract while picking up a solid bet and still getting Udo between 11th and 15th. Number 6 expectations are high, but once the top 5 are off the draft board, you never know what you're going to get from 6 to 30. That's the wild zone. The media praised his offensive skills. Udo's got a cool jump hook in the lane he likes to go to. He's got a mid-range jumper and he's even dropped 3 pointers. Plus, he's got the handling skills, driving past defenders, even drawing lots of fouls. He's also a surprising assist guy for a power forward. Nearly three a game. Basketball IQ much? After the NBA, he was a star in Europe. He won a EuroLeague title with Fenerbahce in 2017 and even got the EuroLeague Final Four MVP award. Impressive, right? He played for the Nigerian national team in the 2019 FIBA World Cup and 2020 Olympics. Not bad at all. And guess what he's up to now? Udo is currently an assistant coach for the Atlanta Hawks in the NBA, working with head coach Quinn Snyder. The Detroit Pistons select Greg Monroe from... When the Detroit Pistons picked Greg Monroe as the seventh overall pick in 2010, they had high hopes for him to be a mainstay for the team. Back then, the NBA was shifting away from traditional big players, which later affected Monroe's career. During his time with the Pistons, Monroe had five solid seasons, standing out as one of the most reliable big men. In his best season, he averaged 16 points, 9.6 rebounds, 3.5 assists, and 1.5 steals per game similar to Mason Plumlee's stats this year in Detroit. It's puzzling how Monroe didn't find a role even as a third choice center when others with similar attributes have. Comparing him to Jalil Okafor's defense, it's hard to see why he's been left out. It's almost like he's been blacklisted, given there are less skilled third string centers still in action. After his fruitful time with the Pistons, things went south for Monroe. A DUI arrest just before his free agency led to an NBA suspension. He then signed a $50 million deal with the Bucks, but became more of a bench player. This marked the start of his decline, with diminishing minutes and stats. Greg Monroe went overseas to play in Germany in 2019 and played internationally for a couple of years before he got signed by three NBA teams to three separate 10-day contracts earlier in 2022. After not finding his role with any team, Monroe went to the Chinese Basketball Association last December and then eventually found himself in Puerto Rico, where he's actively playing now. The Los Angeles Clippers select Al Farouk Aminu from... He kicked it off with the Los Angeles Clippers in 2010, drafted 8th overall. He had a standout performance with 20 points and 8 rebounds against the New Orleans Hornets in early November that year. He was then traded to the New Orleans Hornets in 2011 along with a few others for Chris Paul. In the 2012-13 season finale, he scored 16 points and 20 rebounds. The Hornets became the Pelicans the next day. Off to the Dallas Mavericks in 2014, and his next stop was the Portland Trailblazers in 2015 with a 4-year $30 million deal. He had some impressive games and set career highs. They even got into the playoffs a few times. The Orlando Magic signed him in 2019, but he faced injuries. Aminu then hopped to the Chicago Bulls in 2021 and briefly went to the San Antonio Spurs before ending up with the Boston Celtics for a short while. Internationally, he represents Nigeria. He won the 2015 FIBA Africa Championship with them. Also, he runs a b-ball camp in Nigeria since 2016. Nowadays, Aminu and his wife are up to good work with their foundation doing a yearly basketball camp in Nigeria. The Utah Jazz select Gordon Hayward from... All right, if we're talking college basketball, Gordon Hayward was elite. No joke, he was the lead guy for the Butler Bulldogs back in 2010. I mean, they almost won the whole thing in the NCAA tourney that year. Then, this Utah Jazz team picked him up in the NBA draft at number 9. He stuck around with the Jazz for 7 seasons and even got a ticket to the NBA All-Star Game in 2017. Pretty impressive, right? In the 2017 offseason, Hayward signed as a free agent with the Celtics but was ruled out for the remainder of the 2017-18 season after suffering a fractured tibia and dislocated ankle only 5 minutes into the season opener. A big bummer. He played two more seasons with the Celtics before being traded to the Hornets in a sign and trade agreement in November 2020, where he is still currently and is a good role player for the team. The Indiana Pacers select Paul George of Fresno. Paul George burst onto the scene during a pivotal time for basketball. The game was shifting, and skills like ball handling, making plays, and nailing three-pointers were more valuable than ever. George, a 6'8 guy with a 6'11 wingspan, fit this new style pretty good. The Indiana Pacers picked him as the 10th pick in the draft, and before he turned 23, he was already an NBA standout making an all-star appearance in his third year. I know you guys remember that epic showdown in the 2013 playoffs. George and his Pacers took LeBron's Miami Heat to seven games. The rivalry looks set to define the decade. 
Then came a crushing setback. During a Team USA scrimmage in 2014, George suffered a horrifying leg fracture. That injury hit hard, derailing both his rise and the Pacers' trajectory. After his Pacers days, he made a quick pit stop in OKC with Russ, but everyone knew his main goal was to get to LA. Currently with the Clippers, it hasn't been all smooth sailing. Injuries, the global pandemic, and personal struggles kept him from the glory he and Kawhi Leonard promised when they joined the Clippers. The New Orleans Hornets select Cole Aldridge from the universe. Cole Aldridge got picked 11th overall in the 2010 NBA draft by the Oklahoma City Thunder. But the thing is, he wasn't the most athletic dude for his position. His vertical jump was just 23 inches, which is like almost the worst at the draft combine that year. Offensively, he had some moves like a jump hook and could score close to the basket. But in a nutshell, he wasn't the main guy in his college team and was rarely used. And his scoring dropped from 14.9 to 11.3 points per game between his sophomore and junior years. After college, he joined the Thunder. He signed a two-year deal in 2010, but he then went to the D-League a couple of times also. Later, he was traded to the Rockets in 2012 and then to the Kings in 2013. Aldridge made his way to the New York Knicks in 2013, where he had a solid double-double game. He even re-signed with them in 2014 and dropped a career high of 19 points once. After that, he played for the Clippers in 2015. He had some good games here and there, and he even got a bunch of points and rebounds in a game against the Jazz. Aldridge then joined the Timberwolves, his hometown team, in 2016 on a three-year deal, but he got waived in 2018. He had a short stint with the Atlanta Hawks and then signed with the Taijin Golden Lions in China in 2018. He then called it quits after that. Nowadays, you can find him biking and hanging with the kids. The Memphis Grizzlies select Xavier Henry from... Xavier Henry got snagged at the 12th spot during the 2010 draft when the Memphis Grizzlies scooped him up. Then he bounced around a bit, playing for the Grizzlies from 2010 to 2011, did a stint with the New Orleans Hornets from 2011 to 2013, and finally landed with the LA Lakers from 2013 to 2015. People saw potential with Xavier, but it wasn't all smooth sailing. His college days at Kansas were pretty decent. He had some flashy moves, you know, he could sink some shots, and he knew how to throw some D around. Pause. The thing is, Kansas fans were scratching their heads when he called it quits after just one year. And man, when he hit the big league, it was kind of a bummer. The hype was for a 3 and D guy, you know, hitting those long shots and locking down on defense, but it didn't quite click. The NBA's big guys gave him a hard time, and he seemed shy on the offensive end. Let's break down his stats. He played around 185 games, averaged about 5.7 points and 1.9 rebounds, and shot around 40.6% from the field. His three-point shooting? Around 32.5%, not bad but not great. Now here's the twist. Many folks thought he split college too early, he had the tools to be a big deal in the NBA. But that NBA competition hit him hard, and injuries didn't cut him any slack either. By the time he hit 23, he waved goodbye to the NBA court. The Toronto Raptors select Ed Davis from the- Picked 13th overall by the Raptors, Ed Davis had a roller coaster career in the NBA. He had stints at the Grizzlies and Lakers in the first five years of his career. And back in 2015, he scored a sweet deal with the Portland Trailblazers. 20 mil for three years. And he looked as though he was worthy of that money a few months later. He nailed 17 points and 15 rebounds against the Clippers. That's pretty good stuff, right? I mean, he's like the first Blazers guy to rock 15 points and 15 rebounds from the bench since like forever. He had a pretty good stint with them, but then had his shoulder injury in 2017, which took him out for the season. Bummer. He jumped ship to the Brooklyn Nets in 2018. He wasn't a scoring champ though, averaged just like 5.8 points, but owned the boards with 8.6 rebounds. The Nets must have liked that hustle. He hit 17 points once and 16 rebounds. Then he's off to Utah Jazz in 2019, but bad luck hit him with the left fibula fracture. Man. The next stop was the Minnesota Timberwolves in 2020. But hold up, he did play hopscotch a little bit with the trades. First to the Knicks and then swiftly to the Timberwolves. Must have been a roller coaster for him. The Cavs picked him up in 2021, and in 2023 he signed in Puerto Rico with Mets de Guanabo, then Xinjiang Flying Tigers in China. The Houston Rockets select Patrick Patterson. Patterson started in the NBA with the Houston Rockets back in 2010, when he was picked 14th overall in the draft. The cool thing was, he kicked off with the Rio Grande Valley Vipers, scoring like 18 points and grabbing 10 rebounds a game. That's pretty good, man. He hit it with the Rockets court in 2010 in December. He got his first big break when Luis Scola was out, and Patterson got his first NBA start in 2011. He joined the Sacramento Kings in 2013, but that didn't last too long. The Kings traded him off to the Toronto Raptors along with some other guys for Rudy Gay in December of 2013. He stuck with the Raptors for a good while and even signed a decent deal in 2014. In 2017, that's when he would go to the Oklahoma City Thunder, but his time there got cut short due to a knee injury. A bit of a bummer, but he rebounded by joining the Los Angeles Clippers in 2019. Then came a short stint with the Portland Trailblazers in 2021. 
though he got waived after a couple of preseason games and called it quits at the NBA from there. Now the man's not just about basketball. He teamed up with Joe Riley and then launched a film company called Undisputed Pictures in 2021. Talk about a double play. The Milwaukee Bucks select Larry Sanders from... Larry Sanders was drafted as the 15th overall pick in the 2010 NBA draft. He was known for his tough defense and crazy shot blocking skills. He started strong with the Milwaukee Bucks, playing tons of games in his first few seasons, and even started a bunch in his third season where he averaged almost three blocks per game, which is second best in the league. But things weren't all rosy for Larry. He had this thing going on under the surface, anxiety. It started way back when he was a kid and he didn't even realize it until he's in his 20s. Depression was also knocking on his door. He felt like he couldn't be himself, like he had to hide his struggles. And he turned to weed to deal with it, even though he got suspended a bunch of times because of that. When the Bucks pushed him to come back, he chose his mental health over money. And the Bucks were like, okay, we'll buy out your contract. The NBA got smarter with this and they added a full-time mental health expert to every team staff. Larry thought that was a good move, considering mental health wasn't even a big deal back when he was dealing with his battles. He had short stints in Cleveland in 2017, but it all ended for Sanders in the NBA there, which led to his debut in Ice Cube's Big 3 Basketball League in 2019. And ever since, he's been as dominant as he was back then in college, even taking home the Defensive Player of the Year award back in 2021, finishing the season averaging more than three blocks per game. The Minnesota Timberwolves select Luke Babbitt from... When Luke Babbitt was picked as the 16th overall by the Portland Trailblazers, the experts were all over this dude. People were hyped about his sick jump shot and basketball IQ. But here's the catch. Defaints ain't his strong suit. Seriously, the guy struggles to guard power forwards and small forwards. Footwork? Nah. Quickness? Nope. It's like he's allergic to playing defense. The college scene might have hidden his defensive flaws since he had faced weaker opponents, but Rhode Island exposed him when he couldn't handle Delroy James. Dude went 2 for 14 in the game while James went on a shooting spree. And let's be real, if he was struggling against a guy who won't likely make it to the NBA, he was in for a rough ride when the competition gets to the NBA level. Babbitt didn't really feature for the Blazers. And then after that, he moved to Russia, played a bit, and then he returned to the NBA with the Pelicans, the Heat, Hawks, and finally back to the Heat where he retired in 2018. Since then, he moved into coaching and is currently the coach of a high school team in Nevada. The Chicago Bulls select Kevin Serafon. The Washington Wizards had high hopes for Kevin Serafin as their future center when they picked him 17th overall in the 2010 draft, but he faded into obscurity as an unsigned free agent. Back then, some thought Serafin could never succeed Nene in Washington. He was young and talented and seemed like a great replacement. Both could move well, score inside, and had reliable mid-range shots. Before the Wizards got Nene in 2012, Serafin had a breakout stretch. For about a month, he averaged 15 plus points per game, showing off his sweet post moves in a hook shot. But when Nene arrived, Serafin now had a vet to learn from. The plan was for Serafin to shine in the front court, but it didn't really work out. Bad player development hurt the Wizards, and the blame goes to Randy Whitman and the coaching crew. They didn't nurture Serafin's confidence or fix his bad habits. Whitman would bench Serafin for all his small mistakes, and that never works. Remember Shelvin Mack, Chris Singleton, Jan Vesely? Same story. Serafin's playing time dropped despite better efficiency. From 22 minutes, he fell to under 11 minutes per game. So he left DC for the Big Apple, signing with the New York Knicks, but the Knicks didn't help either. No consistent playing time, no confidence boost. Later, he signed a two-year deal with FC Barcelona in 2017, he won the 2019 Copa del Rey and retired in 2020 due to a knee injury. Internationally, Serafin shown too. He was key in France's silver medal at the 2009 FIBA Europe Under-20 Championship. He played for France at the Eurobasket 2011 Finals and the 2012 Olympics. The Oklahoma City Thunder select Eric Bledsoe. Bledsoe was drafted by the Oklahoma City Thunder, but was immediately traded to the LA Clippers as the 18th pick in the 2010 draft. And after three years, he moved to the Phoenix Suns. But it was in 2017 that Eric Bledsoe really killed it, putting up crazy numbers for the Suns, 24 points, 5.2 rebounds, 8.4 assists, and 1.5 steals through the first few months of the season. If you stretch those stats for a full season, only MVP Russell Westbrook could match him in 2016-17. Bledsoe's been a bit of a tricky character to follow. He bounced between backup roles and dual point guard setups. People even gave him the nickname Mini LeBron because of his physique and unexpected chase down blocks, despite only being six foot one. Back in 2010, he got drafted by the Thunder, but of course ended up with the Clippers, but then he had stints with the Suns, Bucks, and Pelicans. Now from 2022, he's been with the Shanghai Sharks and the Chinese Basketball Association, who also just recently got kicked out of their postseason for match fixing. Hmm. 
The Boston Celtics select Avery Bradley from... Coming into the scene as an ex-Boston Celtics player who somehow made it onto the list of NBA's most overrated players of the last 10 years, yep, you guessed it, it's Avery Bradley who was picked as the 19th overall in the 2010 draft. So, Bradley snagged a couple of those all-defensive awards and people might say he earned them. Defense is kind of hard to put a number on, you know? But his last defensive award was back in 2016, and since then, it looks like he's been coasting on that rep. But fun fact, whenever Bradley's on the court, his team usually ends up giving away more points per 100 possession. Yeah, kinda weird for the defensive player of the year. Bradley's low numbers in blocking shots and grabbing rebounds didn't do his defensive box plus minus any favors. But don't take that stat as a gospel though. He moved a lot. From the Celtics, to a stint in Israel, then back to the NBA with the Pistons, then to the LA Clippers, then the Grizzlies, then the Lakers, then the Heats, and then the Rockets, and then back to the Lakers where he finally called it quits in 2022. The San Antonio Spurs select James Anderson from Oklahoma. What's the deal with Kevin Durant, Blake Griffin, and James Anderson? Well, they all snagged the Big 12 Conference Men's Basketball Player of the Year title. But hold up, that didn't guarantee NBA superstardom, as we've seen from other players like Michael Beasley and Jamal Tinsley. Rafe LaFrance too, remember him? For Anderson, back in 2010, folks were talking about what to expect from this guy after the draft. Fast forward two years later though, things would change quickly. Why? Injuries and bad timing. Rookie year, he tore it up but then got sidelined by a foot injury. By the time he was healed, the Spurs lineup was already set. Then the lockout summer hit, and he missed that action too, so he was on the bench. The next season, he's off kilter, struggling on the court. No comfortable groove. The Spurs had Green and Kawhi on the rise, so Anderson's seat on the bench was glued. So the Spurs grabbed him at 20th overall in 2010. His NBA dance started with injuries, then D-League hoops, then the Spurs dropped the option, and he explored free agency. Then, the Hawks came knocking in 2012. Dropped him like a hot potato, but he bounced the D-League again. Then the Vipers. Second Spurs stint in 2012, but short-lived. The Rockets picked him up in 2013, then let him go. The Sixers picked him up, and he pulled a 36-point game in 2013. He had a Euro adventure in Lithuania, then the Kings, Turkish, and Russian stints followed. A Turkish title here, a Euro League trophy there. In 2022, he was on the Spanish courts with UCAM Morthia. The Oklahoma City Thunder select Craig Brackens from... Craig Brackens played college ball for Iowa State Cyclones, and as a power forward, he was a pretty big deal. See, back in 2009, folks thought he'd get nabbed in the first round of the NBA draft. And guess what? In the 2010 draft, the Oklahoma City Thunder snatched him at 21. But hold up, he got traded pronto to the New Orleans Hornets. He bounced to the Hornets with Quincy Pondexter, but they gave up Brackens for the rights to Cole Aldrich and Morris Peterson. In September of 2010, he was on the move again, this time to the 76ers with Darius Sangaila. This trade swap included Willie Green and Jason Smith. In 2010, Brackens did some running with the Springfield armor of the NBA D-League. He crushed it with around 17 points and nearly 9 rebounds per game. He did the back and forth dance between the armor and the 76ers a few times that season. Then, during the 2011 NBA lockout, he flew to Israel, suiting up for the Maccabi Ashdod BC. He dipped out in 2011, and in 2012, he did a stint with the main Red Claws, and later got a ticket to the Boston Celtics roster for the 2012 Summer League Showdown. After that, he hopped across the pond to Italy, signing with Angelico Biella, but he didn't stick around for long, leaving in December of 2012. From there, he moved around quite a bit, from Turkey to China and even Japan. The Portland Trailblazers select Elliot Williams. My guy, Elliot Williams started his pro ball journey with the Portland Trailblazers back in 2010. He got picked 22nd in the NBA draft, but bad luck hit him hard. He messed up his knee and sat out the whole 2010-11 season. Then in the 2011-12 season, he dislocated his shoulder during practice. Tough break again. Managed to play 24 games and scored about 3.7 points per game. But wait, there's more bad luck. The next season, 2012-13, his Achilles tendon gave out and he couldn't play at all. Wow. He hopped around after that, the 76ers, Santa Cruz Warriors, Utah Jazz, back to Santa Cruz, and then to the Hornets, and then to the Pelicans, and back to Santa Cruz again. Man, this guy has been everywhere. He's won some titles with the Santa Cruz in the D-League and even snagged a finals MVP. Not too shabby, right? Then came a Greek stint with Panathinaikos, and he had some decent stats there. But then he landed with the Golden State Warriors in 2016. And that's some big league stuff, really. Sadly, injuries still kept him from hitting the court during preseason, and he retired later that season. The Minnesota Timberwolves pick, Trevor Booker. Trevor Booker was a baller in the NBA for eight seasons. 
and he called it quits in 2020 after raking in about $34 million. When Trevor Booker entered into the NBA scene in 2010, he knew he needed to bring some serious energy to the Washington Wizards. He was all about those hustle plays, putting in the sweat, backing up his crew, and just being a total pro. The Wizards snagged him with the 23rd pick in the 2010 draft, and he was dead set on showing everyone he belonged in the league. He moved to the Brooklyn Nets, and Booker straight up set the vibe for the Nets and dropped his best numbers yet. This dude was pulling in a career-high average of 10 points, 8 rebounds, 1.9 assists, and 1.1 steals per game. And don't even get me started on his shooting game. 51.6% from the field goal, and he snagged 43 starts in 71 games. And he was no joke in the stats game. 19th in field goal percentage and 19th in rebound percentage for the whole NBA. Booker was a staple in Brooklyn's top two lineups. Hold up, quick pit stop. In March 2018, Booker made a switch and signed up with the Indiana Pacers. And then in August 2018, he inked a deal to rock the court with the Shanxi Brave Dragons over in the CBA. But he had to bounce back to the US in October because his foot needed some doctoring. On April 14th, 2020, Booker called it quits on his career at 32 years old. But he didn't just vanish, he spent some time in the East Coast Basketball League to wrap up his basketball journey. But what's Booker doing nowadays in his life after basketball? He was known to have invested in real estate, particularly in Washington, D.C. area. He had mentioned his interest in real estate during his basketball career and had plans to expand his involvement in the field after retiring from the NBA. On top of that, Trevor Booker co-founded a technology company called QuickBox Holdings, which aimed to provide innovative solutions to the e-commerce and delivery industry. Other initiatives he's been a part of is a startup school in North Carolina by the name of Combine Academy. The Atlanta Hawks pick. Damian James. All right, so back in 2010, Damian James was drafted by the Atlanta Hawks, but ended up with the New Jersey Nets after a trade. He started with the Nets in 2010 and even got his first career start against the Dallas Mavericks in December of 2010. But then in 2012, a foot injury sat him out for the 2011-12 season, man. After that, he bounced around quite a bit. He signed with the Atlanta Hawks in 2012, but got waived. Ended up in the NBA D-League playing for teams like Bakersfield Jam and the Brooklyn Nets. Things started to look up when he made it to the San Antonio Spurs in 2014. He helped them nab an NBA championship in 2014 by taking down the Miami Heat. It's a big win for him. After that, he went on a bit of a basketball world tour. Teams like the Detroit Pistons, Washington Wizards, and even the Alaska Aces in the Philippines. Yeah, he was everywhere. He hopped around some more, playing in France for a little bit with the Le Mans Sarth Basket, then went to Australia's Sydney Kings. His time there wasn't the best though, stats-wise. Struggled a bit on the court, but he didn't give up. He played in Puerto Rico, Israel, and back in Puerto Rico again, teaming up with different squads and keeping the ball rolling. The Memphis Grizzlies pick Dominique Jones. So the Dallas Mavericks picked Dominique Jones in the 2010 draft as the 25th pick. The Mavs bought the pick from Memphis, which turned out to be a smart move. Back then, Jones was known as a tough combo guard from South Florida. He was all about driving to the hoop, drawing fouls, and making things happen near the basket. His defense wasn't bad, and he had good basketball smarts. They tried turning him into a point guard, and he surprised everyone with his court vision. But here's the kicker. The scoring ability he had in college, especially near the rim and from the free throw line, vanished in the NBA. Like, seriously tanked. His shooting percentage from close range was ugly, only 46%, way worse than his 59% from the previous season. The NBA style messed with his game, mainly because he struggled against the bigger and more athletic defenders. He just couldn't adjust, and despite his improved passing skills, he couldn't save his terrible 36.6% field goal percentage. Long story short, he became another one of those Maverick draft busts. You know, joining the likes of Maurice Ager, Nick Fazekas, and soon Rodrigo Bobois. After Dallas, he went through a bunch of teams, from China to Iran. He's currently with the Jilin Northeast Tigers in the Chinese Basketball Association. The Oklahoma City Thunder pick. Quincy Pondexter. Most folks who follow Husky basketball are familiar with Quincy Pondexter's journey. He joined Washington as a solid player in the 2006 class and had a killer career. His senior year was gold, averaging 19.3 points per game and snagging a spot in the all pack 10 first team. Plus, he got an honorable mention with the Associated Press as an All-American, led the Huskies to the NCAA tournament, then got picked 26th in the 2010 NBA draft by the OKC Thunder. He played a cool nine years in the NBA, repping four teams. He even circled back to Washington as an assistant coach in the 21-22 season. So let's rewind a bit. Drafted by OKC, but then traded to New Orleans and Memphis from 2012 to 2017. In 2013, he locked in a four-year, $14 million deal with the Grizzlies, but injuries messed with that group. He missed a whole season in the 2013-14 due to a foot fracture. The next year, he nailed a career best with the Pelicans, but the injury bug bit again after the playoff run in 2015. Multiple surgeries on his left knee, 
and he fought off some serious skin infection. The Chicago Bulls grabbed him in 2017, but he was waived in 2018. Coaching became his game, and he came back to the Huskies in 2021 as an assistant coach under coach Mike Hopkins. He had a stint with the San Antonio Spurs in 2018-19, signing a one-year deal. Quincy Pondexter's basketball DNA is strong, and his uncle was once drafted by the Bulls way back. The New Jersey Nets pick, Jordan Crawford. Jordan Crawford was all about dropping buckets and making a name for himself. He's got moves, man. Get this, he's been around the block in the NBA. Drafted as the 27th overall by the Hawks, he played for them a bit then the Wizards and Celtics, and even joined the Warriors, a solid 268 games under his belt. The dude won Eastern Conference Player of the Week back with the Celtics, dropped double doubles like it's nothing, and even burned the Nuggets for a whopping 41 points in a single game. Yeah, he had some playoff magic too, even if he wasn't always on the court. He also moved to Asia and Europe, and now he found himself in China's ball scene rolling with the Xinjiang Flying Tigers. The Memphis Grizzlies select Graves Vasquez. Back in 2013, the New Orleans Hornets had this really solid point guard named Gravis Vasquez. He was like a hidden gem because he played so well but only cost the team around 1.2 mil. Yeah, he was coming out strong from his time as a Maryland Terrapin and was making waves in the league. As the starting point guard for the Hornets, Vasquez was putting up crazy good numbers. He was scoring more points, grabbing more rebounds, and dishing out more assists than ever before. His passing game was on fire, with 9.4 assists per game only behind Chris Paul and Rajon Rondo. And he wasn't just passing, he was scoring too, averaging 13.8 points per game. Before landing with the Hornets, he did a stint with the Memphis Grizzlies where he was picked as 28th overall in the 2010 draft. He didn't get too much playing time during his rookie season, but he really shone during the 2011 NBA playoffs, helping the Grizzlies make some noise. Then he moved on to the Sacramento Kings, then the Toronto Raptors, and even had a short run with the Milwaukee Bucks. He was making moves, changing teams, and leaving his mark. Nowadays, Vasquez has moved into coaching. He's the associate head coach for the Erie Bayhawks, a team affiliated with the New Orleans Pelicans. Quite the journey from being that breakout star in the NBA, huh? The Orlando Magic select Daniel Orton. Back in 2010, Kentucky basketball was on fire, with five players getting snagged in the first round of the NBA draft. We're talking about John Wall, DeMarcus Cousins, Patrick Patterson, Eric Bledsoe, and Daniel Orton. Orton got picked at 29th overall after just one year at Kentucky. A first rounder, part of the Wildcats crew, but here's the thing, the NBA court didn't quite work for him. He struggled to find his place in the big leagues. The Orlando Magic took him in the first round with a rookie contract signed on July 1st, 2010, but tough luck hit, and he ended up with the New Mexico Thunderbirds due to it. He did manage to get on the NBA court for the Magic, then the Oklahoma City Thunder picked him up for a bit, and he danced between the NBA and the D League a few times. Some uh, hoop hopping, you know? Then it was Philadelphia 76ers, but they let him go, and he moved around a lot from America to Europe and even Asia. The Washington Wizards pick Lazar Hayward. Last but not least, we have Lazar Hayward. This dude was a big deal in college at Marquette. Like he was a four-star recruit and everything. Got himself some AP All-American honors in 2010. That's pretty dang impressive. He took Marquette to the NCAA tournament four times in a row, and that's no small feat. But here's the kicker. When he hit the NBA with Minnesota Timberwolves, things got rocky real quick. Like, his college success didn't exactly follow him. He was drafted 30th in 2010, but his NBA stats were, were not great at all. I'm talking just 2.9 points per game, shooting at 35%. Yeah. He didn't stick around for long either, only going 72 games. Okay, so there you have it, the top 30 picks of the NBA draft. And if I had to sum it up, I would say it was a fairly talented but highly injured draft class. Hats off to Paul George and Gordon Hayward for still hanging around, ironically considering both of them had the worst imaginable injuries. Hey, if you're still there, you're a G. Let me know your thoughts on the 2010 NBA draft and how you look back on it. And while you're at that, I want to continue to take you back in time to the 2009 NBA draft. Yes, the Steph Curry draft. A ton of big names, some bad draft day decisions, crazy stories, and so much in between. Find out what happened to all the players drafted before and after Steph Curry, all in that video right there.